in your capacity as legal advisor to, to, to Cage, um, you make it quite clear as an organization, you make it, you make it quite clear that uh, you know, you recognize the importance of the elections, but the elections are only a small part in your, in what you present and yes. what you argue for. Only a small part of uh, a more encompassing, a more comprehensive yes. um, sort of objective that, that you feel that the Muslim community ought to embark upon. You talk about um, uh, community empowerment. Um, you talk about the need for um, economic independence. You yeah. talk about empowerment on a on a civic sort of uh, sort of level, and 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 that's incredibly important. Particularly, and and this is my personal view. And I, you know, we've been discussing this with various guests now for a while. That the current political system seems to be at a time of crisis, and. Uh, you know, there are several things that manifest this crisis. The failure on every single level. Um, the fact that we now have politicians, the caliber of which, as we saw from the elections, and in the United States, for instance, we're looking at either Biden or Trump. And, and you look around the world and you see that same level yes. of, uh, of shallowness of uh, sort of vacuum kind of, there's no thought, there's no creativity, there's no... So I personally think that th there's, there's a crisis in terms of the political system that governs the world today. And obviously all of this built upon what's happened in Gaza yeah. and the, the whole world in a way moved one way or, or the other uh, to show support and uh, absolute condemnation of the genocide that has taken place. So all of this coming together, what is it precisely that, that, that you, you are trying to achieve? I think this is a perfect point where you mentioned Gaza. I think we, all, mm. we start with Gaza, the biggest tragedy of our time, uh, absolutely. And Gaza is a culmination, where I would say, about 30, 35 years of war in Islam. Mm. that was declared after the defeat of communism. Mm. Um, and it was well known, Tony Bain mentioned it. This is going to be a next And, and this, is, this is central to you. You're saying a 30, 35 year war on Islam. Absolutely. Uh, you ask, look at Tony Bain, late 1989, early 1990s, where he's saying the Western system is based on permanent war. Permanent wars, you had a long war with the Soviet Union. Now that's ended, now need a new enemy. And what we found was that people who were very pro-Israel managed to persuade important policymakers in the United States, and thereby it's the sort of vassal states like Britain and others of the Anglosphere countries, to say that we should be going for full spectrum domination. Mm. This, as you know, is a project for New American Century Think Tank, which openly declared that since the America was now a sole superpower, we should be going for full spectrum domination. And their version of full spectrum domination was to make Israel a regional hegemon in the Muslim world. That's why the first Iraq war, the sanctions throughout the 1990s, then you had the illegal invasion of Iraq, then the quagmire of Syria, the constant ongoing troubles. And they were done primarily to make Israel as the permanent hegemon. They nearly achieved that, in my opinion, with the Abrahamic Accords. Mm. And the events of 7th of October exposed everything. It destroyed all those plans to the extent where they thought, you know what, actually Israel is not that uh, uh, so great, it's not so powerful, because the rulers in the Muslim lands, in my opinion, had tried to convince themselves and convince their populations that it's pointless being aggressive towards Israel. We might as well make peace because they are far too powerful. And so the, what the Palestinians have shown by refusing to surrender since 1948 is actually Israel is very much a hollow power mm -hmm. which cannot exist without absolute and active economic uh, military and financial su and diplomatic support from the West. Mm. And now that's come to the fore. It's become obvious to everybody. Israel is actually not that powerful. So that's the interesting thing here. So almost with, after 35 years of a war in Islam, which included, I must say, I have to say this, 
500,000 children killed in the 1990s. Madeleine Albright said it's a price worth paying. Yeah, regarding Iraq right. and the this sanctions. This is long before Trump. And this is sanction, long before yeah. Brexit. Yeah. This is long before the obvious fascists. This is Democrats. This is left of centre politics. Now, the reason why I mention that is that whether we're talking about Labour, whether we talk about Democrats, whether we're talking about Keir Starmer, Barack Obama, the overall objective of the Western, particularly the British and American system, is to have permanent hegemony, the, 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 what they enjoyed in the world over the last few centuries. Mm -hmm. So the question is, do these elections make any difference to that at all or not? Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why I would go back 35 years is, is that these elections have to be seen in a context of a much wider historical way of things happen in the West. Mm. All right, so if that doesn't, hasn't changed, if war, permanent war remains, and one person over the last 35, in my understanding, has posed a little threat to that, that was Jeremy Corbyn, and we all saw how they all came out of the woodworks. They okay. didn't even try to hide. You have, uh, let's just say, you have covered quite an expansive yeah. period of time, and you've also commented on uh, a wide array of global uh, issues. Yes. You know, you talk about the Madeleine Al Albright's um, infamous statement regarding the killing of half a million yeah. children that was pertaining to the Iraq and the, and the sanctions regime imposed upon Iraq after 1991. Um, and I'm sorry, the reason why I mention uh, Madeleine yeah. is because I want to contextualize the so-called horrors, the modern horrors of the genocide, because the Israelis, Netanyahu, is being blamed individually as a bad guy. Yeah. Let's link that with who was in power in Britain, yeah. in America, when half a million children were being killed like yeah, that I, way. I, I agree absolutely with yeah. what you say in that that kind of false perception that yes, it's just the Republicans. Yeah, yeah. That's false because we have evident, uh, yes. evidence here that shows that actually, you know, regardless of whether it's, it's the Democrats or the Republicans, that, that, you know, this is whether you call it the establishment, whether you call it the system, whether yeah. you call it, but this is basically how America has been behaving now yeah. for, for decades. But I'm gonna start from the very beginning of what you said. Mm. You, you said that now and since the collapse of the United uh, for, uh, Soviet Union, that America particularly has been in um, a war, in a state of war against Islam and now for almost 30 to 35 years. Yes. Now, my question is, and based upon this, we, are, we both know yeah. the situation of the Arab world, of the Muslim world, and it is a really dire situation. I mean, it's not like we're talking about, um, uh, you know, two billion who are together, who are united in vision, who are united in objective, and who, are, who, who pose some sort of threat to ever, you know, or at least in, 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 in our lifetimes, to somehow create any kind of project. We're seeing that the vast majority of Muslim countries are part of what we call the third world or the underdeveloped world. They have immense problems, such as famines and such as, you know, deprivation and poverty and all sorts of issues that, that, that stifle any kind of imagined rise to challenge the status quo. Why would a country like the United States, which by the way, I, I was quite close to Tony Benn, and I remember, I mean, most of his comments were warnings to America not to behave like an empire. And, um, but why would America in the might, in, you know, in its element, being the superpower of the world after the collapse of the Soviet Union, be so occupied with the Muslim world? doesn't make sense. Um, well, for a start, the Muslim world does have a huge amount of resources, natural resources that they want. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been talking uh, recently about the, the genocides in, gen in Congo and in, in Sudan. So it's an issue of resources, mm -hmm. raw materials that are necessary. Uh, we're talking about attempted coups in Bolivia, where the Latinium sort of uh, mines there that they want and they need that for their future sort of development, their plans. So it does go back to centuries old policies, mm -hmm. occupy the places 
where you've got the natural resources so that you have a, 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 a leverage over your economic competitors. So if we go back to the plan for the Project for New American Centuries, their enemy wasn't just Islam. Their, their competition was EU, their competition was India, China, Russia, Brazil, all the Brazil countries. In other words, the power must remain with America, America being at the top, aided by Britain, Israel, and the sort of agrosphere countries, right? So that was the plan. It wasn't very pro-French, it wasn't pro, pro-German. So they have a little gang, and that's the gang that's been trying to operate. And obviously, as you've seen, we've got BRICS, we've got other sectors growing, right? Now, it just so happens because uh, people who are very close to Israel uh, managed to persuade, win the argument, that they should start in the Middle East, it's done. And it's, it's not a minor thing. We look at a number of people killed, millions of people killed, millions of people displaced. And I'm interested in terms of centuries-old historic uh, 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 concepts like genocide and slavery. Millions are killed in the last two, three decades. Is this about, is this, I mean, uh, once again, I'm trying to dissect uh, this concept of, of a war being waged against Islam or against Muslims. And I'm wondering, um, do you see this as a war against people or against a civilization? Or is it merely as simple as it's a war for resources? I think, I think, listen, I personally think it's a war for resources. Mm. I think it's a war for resources. But they have resources. I mean, all the oil is basically in countries which are allied to them. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, absolutely, so yes. They have it, don't they? Yeah, but I think I'm also actually um, a fan of what Julian Assange says. Mm. War is a racket. Mm. And ultimately, it's about, we talked about systems earlier, yeah. in terms of elections, who runs nations. It's the biggest fraud, in my opinion, of the ruling elite is first of all against their taxpayers. Because it's ultimately trying to persuade their taxpayers to let certain sections, the ruling elites, whether it's a big business, whether it's a military or a pharmaceutical or banking or whatever, to have a large chunk of the taxpayers' money to go to that. In return, we are told, you need it for this, you need it for this, you need it for this. The war lobby is one of the most influential ones, and the security state is one of the most influential ones, right? So these people do have a tendency, I mean, it happens in all countries, not just in Britain. I, I have links with Pakistan, it happens with Pakistanis, Egypt, Iraq, I'm sure. They all think that the elite think that, you know what, they know better, and only people are just a pest. How do we keep them at bay? Mm. Ultimately, we want to keep them pacified. So we either use fear, or we use breads and circuses. Just keep them working, we don't want any hassle. They don't really want to use coercion. They want a pacified uh, citizenry, right? In the process, when you have more competition, when it's no longer easy to go and steal resources from the empire and bring it here and build America, bring Britain, build France, then because the national case becomes smaller, you ultimately have to show your people why your, their standard of living is going down. Mm. And when their standard of living is going down, so they'll use things like fear of communism, fear of Islam, or they use racism towards Jewish people, or Irish people, or Muslims in order to keep them divided and deflected. Mm. So these are the ways of ruling going on for centuries. And what we're living through now, and because there's so much information out there, it's so obvious, Muslims just happen to be the latest bogeyman, mm. right? If you look at history, it's happened to others as well, right? So what we're going to look at is that we have a war of resources, uh, going on in the context, and this is where our work comes in, the cage comes into it, right? We come to this country, we are here as Muslims, and there's the largest population of Muslims in the last few decades, last 60 years. So what do you do? So on the one hand, the, the state doesn't really want stability, thinking we want everybody to live calmly. But on the other hand, it has another imperative, which is to justify to his people why half a million children have to be killed, why a genocide has to be committed, so a dehumanization has to take place. Mm -hmm. So when that dehumanization takes place, hatred spreads. So suddenly, Muslims are dangerous. You know, like com uh, Russia's under the communism under the bed, now it's a Muslim under the bed, the extremist everywhere, right? So that culture war is done on a regular basis for the last 35 years, right? When you have that culture for the last 35 years, so you, on one hand, what you have, you have a very divided polity, right? People are looking at each other, blaming Muslims for everything or other immigrants, they are not looking at the elites. That's the games the elites play all over the world. Mm. Divide and rule their populations because they want to maintain that control. So now, 
we talk about democracy, we talk about elections, how does a citizen change that state of play? What does a citizen do? So what do we do as Muslims here? So as Muslims here, our role... Before we come to this, because yeah. this, uh, this I think is something that we need to, to discuss at length, but before this, I want to take you back to something you also said, and I'd like to expand a little bit upon. You said that the 7th of October um, exposed yeah. something. The weakness and, of Israel. And you said you, the weakness of Israel. How is this significant? How is this significant? Why is it significant? I mean, okay, fine. So Israel was supposed to be, let's say, the superpower of the region. Yes. And the 7th of October, as well as I would argue, various other incidents before that, exposed <coughs> that um, Israel isn't the infallible partner or party yeah. um, as it is presumed to be. Yes. Yeah. What does that expose exactly? I mean, and, and what, what does it lead to? I think it's very dangerous. What it's going to lead to is an extremely difficult times we're coming to. And I think the fact that they're actually live streaming a genocide mm. it, it exposes a lot. It exposes the inherent fear of a system which has existed in confidence for many centuries. So they call it the age of Europe between 1492 and 1945, mm. age of America, I'm quoting Cornel West here, age of America 1945 to 2021. What's going on here really is the decline of empires. So Israel is a central point, it's the front line of the, 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 uh, the Anglosphere-led empire. The way that's been exposed actually shows, and then we, this is really important linked to actually BDS as well, actually, and, and the fact that the, the local governments, uh, the BDS bill, the local governments are all invested in Israel, universities are invested in Israel. What it shows is, is the public sector, the public institutions know that Israel is such an important part of Western foreign policy, Western economic system that based upon a very predatory foreign policy, now, if Israel is exposed like the way it has, that it's actually weak, it actually now shows that actually a lot of countries are going to get more confident and say, no, we can now challenge American-led Western hegemony. And this is what's going on here. So I, I think they really, really, this what worries me is that how far would they go to use as a deterrence to others? Don't mess with Western supremacy. And that's what worries me is that in terms of permanent war, in terms of genocide, mm -hmm. in terms of what to do at home because the population at home, whether it's America, whether it's Britain or France, majority people have normal human compassion, mm. right? Even people who are anti-immigrant, even people who don't like Muslims in the West, thinking, you know what, we cannot tolerate what's going on here, what we're seeing. Do you think that, uh, I mean, as, as you argue that uh, the 7th of October exposed the... Um, the fallibility of Israel yes. and the vulnerability of, of, of Israel, do you think that by extension, it also exposed probably the fallibility of Western civilization? I think so. Of, of you know, the Western powers and the Western world that has propped up Israel now for 75 years, supported it to the hilt financially, militarily, intelligence-wise and the such. Do you, do, you think, do you think that there's an argument now that the West generally, I mean, all this fight and the fact that the West has supported Israel even beyond the pale, you know, even against the ICC or the ICJ, um, do you think that part of that is because the West itself regards that what's happened and what continues to happen, the defiance of the Palestinians in the face of Israeli brutality is an affront and an exposition of its own weaknesses? Do you so think? I just want to expand that point, actually, right? And uh, try to link with us to the work we do. Western civilization, you know, it has to be said, it's actually based upon slavery, expo slavery exploitation, predatory foreign policy. Mm. It's based upon that, right? And most Western people will accept that. Mm. And um, what we had was, and this is where... As, I, 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 would, I would disagree that what most Western people... Well, let me explain that. I, mean, I, think, I think, listen, most Western people, the, the, the deal of my limited understanding with history is this. I mean, I'm, I, I'm sure many people will disagree or others elaborate on that. People will know more detail and more nuanced, right? My understanding of history is that, look, the West developed in terms of financially, academically, culturally, mm. all these institutions developed as a result of being able to get resources from outside by hook or crook. Mm. 
mm. not necessarily at market price mm. by using predatory means. Now, when you have that advantage, it's like a drug dealer who goes and does drug dealing outside at home, sends their children to top universities, builds a lovely house, go and finances some ac academies and builds these galleries and lives a very sophisticated life. God, I don't even see Godfather, that's one of my favorite films. So yeah. in a sense, everybody wants respectability. So what we had in the Western civilization in the last few centuries is what's going on abroad with people from the colonies, the people who understand history have learned that, thinking the reality, the brutality of Western system, coming here where the people, people at home are thinking, you know, everything's honky-dory. Mm -hmm. So what you've got here, and this is really interesting because it comes down to the laws I'm going to talk to you about, right? And what they call the crisis of democracy. So whether it comes to the civil rights movement in America or understanding the history of uh, slavery and what the, why the reparations are necessary and what the disadvantages of black communities have had, or whether you have Muslim countries, uh, Muslim people living in the West thinking, actually, your, your development is based upon exploitation for the reason why you, I had to leave Pakistan, you had to leave Iraq, because our families didn't want to leave their families. Mm. It's because you destroyed those countries. And you, you said earlier about why those countries are not developed. If you look at lack of development, if you look at how a country organically grows, the most important thing it needs is stability. Mm. Stability, no interference from outside. So when you have outsiders coming and deliberately bombing you or destabilizing you on a regular basis, whether through bombs or whether through uh, controlled elites who are sort of have all their retirement packages in the West, what the problem then is that, well, you actually you're interfering, you're stopping those countries from developing. Mm. So what the people are saying is, look, we don't want to leave our homes. We want to stay at home. Don't mess with our countries. That's the concept of neocolonialism. Now in the West, as a result of all the people who arrived as immigrants or economic migrants or refugees, mm -hmm. they, their children, their next generations have that understanding. And what they're saying is, we actually want America to have an ethical foreign policy. We want America to have a fair trade. We want Britain to have an ethical foreign policy. We don't want Britain to have a, a predatory economic policies that are unfair to other people, exploit other countries. Now that creates what's called a crisis in democracy. Yeah. And there's a book actually, it was written in the 1970s by the uh, neoconservatives linked with Henry Kissinger, et cetera, which said they recognize that, look, they were worried that the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement that was against Vietnam mm -hmm. was creating a, such a large alliance of people within America who were posing a threat to the ruling elite. Mm -hmm. And they're thinking, how can we suppress this? Because this is dangerous to our monopoly over decision making. Right? We talk about democracy, but this way we're really going to have to listen to these people because they are becoming very powerful. So that's why you have to look at policies like Cointelpro. Cointelpro is important because it links us to the policy of prevent here. Mm. So the prevent, as you know, full well, the whole issue of extremism is how do we smear people who are pose a threat to our way of ruling, holding us to account so that they don't develop, they don't organize, that other respectable people don't have anything to deal with them. So from Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, other civil rights leaders, they were all smeared. They're very heroic now, but at the time, nobody wanted to know them. Because if you want to build your own career, if you want to be a respected uh, person in mainstream media or mainstream politics, you had to avoid people like that, mm. all right? That's what Prevent is about. It's a development of that. There's a crisis of democracy because what they're worried about is Muslims living here, particularly Britain, it's actually quite easy. You and I know, yeah, you're from Yorkshire, I'm from the Midlands. Most people are neighbors, are friends, white, black, non-people. It's much easier to get on. And most people have normal, decent human values of compassion. They don't want to have all this bloodshed. They don't want all this. So when we're engaging, when we're mixing at local civil society level, work, etc., we are becoming a powerful force. That powerful force creates a threat for the establishment, the ruling elites, who for centuries have had this deal that we're going to do things our way. And I think that's why I think when we talk about elections, I always say, look, be careful about elections. Don't put your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. Your most important thing is your communities, right? Build your communities, help them, allocate your resources there, go and meet them, develop them. Because through those communities, you can actually get rid of Islamophobia, you can get rid of discrimination, you're building personal bonds, and you're helping economic growth with each other, businesses, etc. And that way, what you do is you become much more resilient. Mm -hmm. And I think... It comes down to whether on a sort of global level, dealing with elites, 
how they run foreign policy, how they run economic policy at home, how they run their government at home, to actually going down to grassroots level where you think, well, actually, there's injustice here as well mm. in our communities. And as we'd seen over sort of austerity and all these sort of things, there are so many people suffering. Mm. So as a Muslim, as an individual citizen, what's our objective? Our objective is actually to be proactive, mm. get out there, involved in civic society, get involved in civic life. And therefore, you're a much more useful person rather than getting caught up in the business of going down to Westminster, trying to stay uh, a respectable uh, politician, a respectable person who mainstream politicians will think so, liquid. So, ju so just, just to clarify, you're calling on the Muslim individuals as well as communities yes. that make up Britain to open up, not to close, not to become insular. Yes. Not to become, not to build walls around them. Yes. I mean, this is this is quite important. You're not telling them that um, uh, what they need to do is to stay away and to stay, you know, inside their their own homes or their own mosques or the such. You're telling them that they have um, a, almost a duty and a responsibility yeah. to actually act in order to dispel this. Call it a facade, call it a conceit, call it whatever it is that uh, appears to be um, a face of civility. There's a deliberate attempt to divide and rule. It's always been like that. As I said earlier, the way to rule by elites, by its, uh, the, the establishment, is to ensure their citizens are never united. Keep them divided somehow, right? So what we have to do is we have to try to get around that. Mm. and find ways of actually building links and building communities, right? So I think to make, be a bit more refined in terms of uh, uh, our, our sort of uh, overall uh, thinking at this stage, instead of focusing too much on elections, mm. and we've seen with, with this, this election just taking place now, it's actually just another circus, right? What's really important is what we can do in our localities to look at unemployed people, look at people who are suffering, people with mental health issues, people with housing issues, people who have problems with dealing with bureaucracy, national government, local government, dealing with the police. What can we do to assist them? But isn't, isn't part of ways to assist those that you've spoken of, and I totally agree with those, you know, array of issues that you've just mentioned, is to get in positions where you have political authority? Well, that's the good point you raised, actually. That's my whole point, that is, do they have political authority? Mm. And I would argue they don't. Mm. Because I think this is, the, this is a facade that whether in America, whether in Britain, the elites put down, they say, well, these are your uh, elected um, officials, All right? So now what we've seen over the last 30 years in my sort of uh, understanding where I've grown up in politics is that you have a party system where all they need to do has influence the top party hierarchy, everybody else in the managerial line has to play the ball. If they don't, they're kicked out. Whether it's Conservative Party, whether it's Labour Party or Lib Dems, you have to play by the rules. Now, in order, to, the real power lies with the think tanks and powerful lobbies who will be meeting privately, whispering. The donors, they say, in America, is they have the real power. So what... For us, for only vote, voters and taxpayers, oh, look, you've got a choice every five years or every four years. That's, I say, is deception. And we have to educate people to understand that the people who are put in front of you, a lot of them are very nice people. They have genuine people. They have good desires uh, and uh, good, good, good sort of intentions. But actually, they lack the power. And if we understand that, then we can actually find ways to empower them to take on those powerful lobbies to empower them to take on their sort of donors and say, look, actually, these, are in, these people are much more accountable to their constituents rather than to a party machine or to a particular lobby or something. And, and I think that understanding, that education is very, very important. Do you, I mean, I mean your, your picture for a community that's empowered, I mean, you, you spoke about uh, economic empowerment, you, talk, you, you, you spoke about um, um, assisting and... Uh, and um, you know, solving the problems of the weakest within our societies and, and the like. And all that is fine. And you also mentioned the fact that uh, we might think that Parliament has all the power when actually it doesn't. And I would also tend to agree to a large degree with that. Mm -hmm. But to you, what does, what does the, an empowered community look like? Meaning, 
would you uh, advise that uh, Muslims, for instance, or Muslim communities, or even minority communities, um, uh, enter into the private sector and uh, you know have a, a, a stand uh, within that, within the marketplace? Uh, would you talk about? Uh, the power of information and therefore university and academia? Are you talking about research and innovation and development and therefore we're talking about, you know, what exactly does it look to you? You know, um, at CAGE, one of our earliest funders, a very big supporter were the Quakers at the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. Mm. And interestingly, the advice we received from them, and this is going back nearly 20 years now, the advice we received was that what the Muslim community is going to go through now the new sort of the, 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 the demonized community is what the Quakers went through two, three hundred years ago. And they said, we went exactly through the same system. And what they did, they actually set up their own businesses, Barclays, Nestle, Cadbury's. They set up their own meeting houses, you know, friends meeting houses all over the place. So they created a sub-economy. Mm. You see now those institutions are now globalized international institutions. Mm. So in a sense, in a time of oppression, at a time of suppression, is also a time of opportunity. And I think that people need to realize how the system works, that this is not us poor Muslims, it's just us. It's the way the system is. It's the system needs a victim. System needs somebody to bogey, a bogey community. And as long as you don't end up being in a position of despair, where you think, you know, oh, wow, me, and then keep your head down, this is not it. This, you've got to be optimistic. You've got to have vision. You've got to have an understanding of history. You've got to understand, actually, with, you know, every, every sort of oppressor has to fall. Yes. Right? So therefore, whether it's Israel, whether it's Pharaoh, whether it's Western Empire, whether it's Russian Empire, everything is going to fall. Mm. Right? Now, what, when it happens, that's up to Allah. Mm. Right? What we got to do is we got to play our part in whatever skills we have, whether it's legal, whether it's political, academic, whether it's business, whatever the skills that we have, we use them. And I think the important point we got, want to get across is that never despair. And particularly as a Muslim, we have belief in Allah, which is that, you know what, everything is from Allah. Mm. Uh, and as long as we have that sort of value there, whatever we do, I think we remain optimistic and we challenge everything with confidence. Um, Let's, uh, let's go back a little bit to what's happening in Gaza. Now, it seems, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, it seems that, uh, you know, especially with the involvement of the ICJ and, and after that the ICC, that the international community is moving, let's say, in the right direction, not at the pace that you and I would like, uh, not to the extent and sort of, you know, real uh, sort of might that we would have wanted international law to be applied, but it's moving in the right direction. We're also seeing a global movement, whether it be the students, whether it be societies and the such, in support of Palestine, condemning Israel and Zionism, condemning the stands of, of the United States and UK and Western governments in, in aiding Israel and providing weapons and the such. Um, surely that's a good thing. Surely, you know, that, that shows that, um, uh, you know, Muslims, whether they be Western Muslims living as minority, whether they be Muslims living within their own realm, within Muslim countries, surely it means that, you know, there is now an opportunity to, uh, to actually express themselves in a way um, that, that is befitting of this kind of movement. Yes, um, but I think when we look at what's happened in Gaza, mm. the barbarity and the contempt and the arrogance uh, of those who are doing what they're doing and people like Keir Starmer saying supporting the right to cut off gas, electricity, water and all public institutions in the West, academic, um, public sector, um, all of them supporting Israel. What I say is that, look, as citizens, as taxpayers living in the West, we are beneficiaries of a system which is based on that oppression. Mm. So I think our responsibilities, our duties have to be a bit more accelerated, are much more important. So I, I, I just don't want to get complacent into thinking that in historical curves, things are moving. Yes, I agree with you in terms of 
centuries old his, historical terms, things are moving. But I, I think there needs, there needs to be much more a sense of urgency. Mm. And we have to recognize the way the Western system works, it lets you go on well-organized marches. It actually wants you to go into well-organized marches because yeah. it wants you to think that you have a stake in what they're doing. Yeah. So if we failed to massive anti-war movement, which you know very well about, about 2,300, massive movement, yeah. we failed. It still went ahead. Massive number of people, millions of people marching. I, I say the majority of this country are against war, whether it's 2003, whether it's the genocide now, but we failed. So we got asked much deeper questions. We question. failed in what? We failed to stop a genocide, hmm. right? That's so right. we st failed to stop our government, even stopping to send arms to Israel, yeah. despite what the ICJ is saying, despite what the, what's happening in the ICC. So we got asked much deeper questions. Are we being tricked? Are we being led into that uh, complacency? Look, things are now happening. The institutions are working. Look at these ICJ, ICC, these are working. So again, I look at systems. But would you, I mean, would, I, I would propose a, a different scenario. I would say that uh, since 7th of October, since the beginning of this genocide, We've had several Israeli factories closed down. We've had several universities divest from from uh, from Israel. We've had several, you know, the boycott campaign around the world is seeing shares of country, uh, companies like uh, McDonald's and Starbucks plummet. Um, so we are seeing an effect. So maybe, um, and this is like I said, another argument. Um, maybe it's that it's working, but because of the balance of power it's not working to the extent that we would like it to work, but it's working. It, we can see that, for instance, this particular factory somewhere in the Northeast has closed down as yes. a result of that. This particular contract, Intel, yes. that wanted yes. to open a factory 27 or $28 billion yes. worth, closed it down. Yeah. Uh, so there are things that are, that are working, um, but it's just because of the balance of power that it's working at a slower pace than we yeah. all, all wish for. I, I want to question this thing about balance of power. Mm. Why should we allow the elites who are dependent on our taxes, mm. where the majority of us yeah. against the genocide, okay. should treat us with contempt and continue what they're doing? Mm. So that's, that's the question we need to ask ourselves. What's happening is brilliant. I, I love Palestinian action, all these people who are doing direct action and actually taking active steps to stop a genocide in line with the International Convention on Genocide, right? They're actually doing, taking active steps, actually enforcing the law. Uh, and those who try to stop them are breaking the International Convention on Genocide. That's my mm. position, right? But I think we also got to remember is that not to allow ourselves to be caught, put down the garden path of this legal matter, this legal issue. Because remember, the Israeli objective is, is to kill and destroy and, and, and flatten as much as Gaza possible so that when it finishes, that people voluntarily leave. So they achieve their objective. That's one of the objectives. Mm -hmm. So our, it's imperative on us as citizens of countries which are sponsors of Israel, protectors of Israel, to actually put more pressure on our governments to say, you know what, we know what, the, what you're doing on, we'll continue our long-term objective, but in the short term, we want, demand that you stop uh, sending weapons, we demand that those who are ministers who are involved in those weapon sending, what there's a plausible genocide, the Metropolitan Police, others start investigating them, start uh, lo looking at criminal investigation into them. So in other words, we got to move and be more proactive citizens and ask for our values our part of our sort of uh, legal positions to be enforced. And I think that's where we've got to be, yes, alhamdulillah, what's happening is wonderful mm -hmm. in terms of Israel being exposed and all the global movements that's developing, but I think we need to be much, much faster, much more urgent. Mm. And also, and I, 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 this is a point I, I absolutely agree with, and that is that um, formal institution and to, to, to formally create the channels through which we are told you can make change through this is something that needs to be disrupted. I, I absolutely agree with this. I, I believe that, you know, on many, many occasions, the institutionalization of work, the formalization of work, um, is something that um, civic society must resist mm. because it sort of puts it in molds, in blocks, in templates. And it says, 
you're free to demonstrate, you're free to protest, you're yes. free to do, but within those parameters. Yes. And you're, you know, you could ask and demand whatever you want to, but but ultimately speaking, you're not really changing much. Radical change, transformative change is beyond your reach. Well, well this this is what you gotta admire. <laughs> That's why admire is the wrong word, but you gotta be fascinated by the way the facade works. Mm. Right in sort of developing countries, they're much more obvious with the elites that push the boot down, and there's an open hostility between the the citizens and the elites and, and the rulers. But in here, it's when the people don't see their chains; they think they're free. Oh, oh I, I can go and protest. I can go and speak. But can you actually stop a genocide? Yeah. So if you look at over the last 35 years, for example, the endless war we're talking about, the permanent war, millions are killed. In Britain, a civilized enlightened, civilized country has been part of an endless war where millions of people have been killed, yeah. right? Millions have been displaced. Now, what kind of society, I mean, if I say, say you and I are British people, we are British citizens, we are British taxpayers, we, this is where we belong, you and I are complicit. Yeah. And in return for that- As taxpayers. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. In return for that, in return for that, we are subject to first world privileges. Mm -hmm. Now, whether you're Joe Block from Newcastle, who's been born here generations, or whether you and I are new citizens through our families coming here, we are all part of the system where the system accepts us. And you say, yeah, 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 come and stay here. Go and protest if you want to. We give you so many rights. Rights is one thing, but actual ability to influence policy, that's something we need to think about much more deeply. Mm -hmm. That's when it comes down to elections. Elections is a deception. It's a way of tricking, look, focus on, wait five years, you know, get your chance in five years. Mm. No, five years is far too long. Too many people killed, get killed in five years. And even then, by the time you control uh, people, the, it, careers in politics and, 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 and media and everything, we know that you're not gonna allow them to actually represent the true values of the citizens. Mm. So this is where I think we need a much more of a effective, smarter, well-informed community, communities uh, organizations where you say, actually, we know what's going on. Yeah. And therefore we know how you work, how you operate. Yeah. And we're not gonna let you continue the way you've continued for decades and, and centuries. And hence, political engagement becomes one facet yes. of a collective, comprehensive sort of community effort. Yeah, Am yeah. I right? Well, if you define so you're politics... Not, you're not, you're, I mean, what, what I'm trying to get at is, are you advocating for Muslims, let's say, or other minorities to disengage? From from uh, from the political process. I should be. I'm not. I mean, Cage doesn't have really have a position on this one, to be honest with you, because it, it, in a sense, it doesn't want to make it as the be all and end all. Because whether you boycott it or whether you say fully participate, again, it gives you the credibility that we don't want to give it to. Because I think our focus, our focus is actually community engagement, community empowerment. Now, there is an argument from a personal perspective, just to prolong, uh, take further what your point is, is that what sanctions as citizens can we impose on a system that refuses to listen to us? Mm. Now, is that civil disobedience? Does that mean trade union blockades? Does that mean uh, more factories being blocked? Does that mean uh, taxpayers' uh, 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 strikes, like the poll tax happened in 1990? So these are the kind of things that can be talked about and discussed mm -hmm. when communities are getting together and are talking to each other and be empowering each other. At the moment, if it's all about whether well, it's going to be Labour or Independent or Conservatives in power, we're not focusing where we should be focusing, where our strengths is. And our strength is with individuals, with the citizens in our communities. And I think what we do is if we just push all our resources or majority of our resources towards people who are far too easily to be controlled in, 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 in Westminster, in higher sort of institutions, then I think we're wasting a lot of our time and resources. You're a, you're a solicitor. What role does the judiciary and the justice systems play within this construct that you speak of? Well, when I... I mean, obviously, we can talk also about the media. We well, can no, talk no. about the security forces, but, but from your perspective as a solicitor... Well, I'll, I'll tell you this. The judiciary comes into the concept of democracy. democracy uh, yeah. Judiciary is very important in a part of yeah. democracy. Democracy, rule of law, what they call is, is based upon separation of powers. So mm. separation of powers, the prime minister to his executive cabinet will make a decision... Parliament will hold it to account, debate it. 
the free press will actually then discuss that, disseminate that, create a real debate in the in, in public. And when the law is actually, there's a dispute comes in a law, a judiciary, independent judiciary will then go around to um, um, to adjudicate independently which way the, the decision should be, how to interpret that. Now, this is another part of the, the Western system that many of us who come from very recently, relatively recently, from our reference points are tyrannical, brutal dictators. We, I'm sorry to say, too many people get, end up, their minds get colonized by the system, get overawed by a system, where they think, wow, this is a proper independent judiciary, we got uh, a democracy, we got rule of law, we got this. What we do in a cage is actually, is to actually put a mirror to the system. Mm. So our so remit is due process, rule of law. And what we've shown through whether torture evidence, whether it's secret evidence, whether it's lack of due process in courts, whether detention without charge, what we've seen is that actually the system, the moment it's threatened, will instantly turn to those tyrannical ways that we escaped from. A lot of people, refugees come from where the reference points are. So this system itself doesn't have a problem that the moment it needs to turns nasty, turns quite authoritarian. Mm. And that's what Cage's success has been. And that's why it's really hated the white tall people like Michael Gove and William Shawcross, because we actually focus on that. And with, with case studies, with evidence, actually shown actually, well, this is actually what the system's really about. And the, all those things that many people in the developing world, former imperial, uh, empire days, thinking, wow, mother countries, are they so wonderful, is they're so fair and equal. They're not. They're only fair and equal if you keep your head down. But if you keep your head down, you're already in Dubai as well, right? But is that the kind of citizen you want to be? Do you want, do you want to just to earn money and live, or do you want to be able to assert your values as a human being? That's why we come here. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, well, you know, what? I want to be free to speak. So this, in these people say, well, actually, you got freedom to speak. And you see, mm. you know, through the extremism, the way that suddenly you get smeared without due process. You don't have your day in court. But although it's not the, system, the government doing it, where you have access to judiciary, it's done through the corporations. The corporations, the big business are united with the government. Whereas government, you can take to the court. But the corporation, you can't because it's a private entity, but it achieves the same purpose, which is what the government wants. So it's a way, it's a, what we call the new system of developing, it's actually now called corporatism. So corporatism, and you should look at what Benito Mussolini says, what corporatism is. This is the kind of system now we have developed, we ended up with due to, in line with the ideological goals of the neoconservatives who are dominating politics and all mainstream parties, whether in Europe, particularly Britain and America. Mm. And these are the people we have to blame for the foreign policy that's killed millions. These are the people we have to blame for bringing those kind of authoritarian uh, legal system within Britain and America. Mm. Uh, recently, we had the European parliamentary elections, which saw a wave of far-right parties uh, emerge. And, um, and, and, you know, if you, if you look at the dark blue spots around Europe now. It's, it's a fairly scary kind of uh, prospect. We also have the American elections happening in, in a few months' time. Yeah. And um, if polls are to be believed, then it seems that Trump is going to see his second term at the White House. Mm. What does that tell you about the state of world affairs? I mean, and does, does, does that fit with the kind of description that you gave, because surely, surely, I mean, this is something that, that I'm, I'm asking myself as you're, you're making your quite well-constructed argument, I have to say, and that is even this system, which, which is, let's just say, there's a lot of um, uh, smoke screen, there's a lot of, you know, smoke and smoke screen, uh, mirrors and smoke screen, um, surely it, it needs to preserve its own standing, it needs to preserve itself, right? I mean, so what is it that is happening right now with the emergence of the far right? Is that something, is, is it this particular system showing its true face? Is it the system actually uh, e e e exposing its weaknesses? And is it in crisis mode? Yeah, I think it's a system being forced to expose itself. 
So whether it's the Americans and the British and the oldest countries helping Israel with this genocide, forced into actually now being linked with Israel, linked with Netanyahu, or whether it's at home, where all those years of a system based on predatory policies abroad, when it's exposed at home, is actually what's called liberalism. The other side of it is illiberalism. Mm. So fascism, many would say, and there's a, there's, a, there's a book called Sorcerer's Apprentice, you can read it and tell the whole point is that fascism is the other flip side of liberalism. So in other words, liberalism and fascism will twist and turn as and when it suits itself. So because at the moment they can't put on a good face, they can't put on a very nice diplomatic face, they are turning to what it re the other side, will, which is that, look, we can turn nasty as and we want to, right? And this is quite a really important point in history now I think we need to look at because Steve Bannon, one of the ideologues who talks about yeah. uh, fascism, and he talks about a change happening every eight years, a reset happening, whatever, right? So what a lot of these people are trying to do is they're thinking, you know what, it's been sort of 80 years since fascism was defeated. And obviously they were never completely defeated. A lot of them sort of turned into liberal and a lot of them turned into right wing and, you know, adopted a different format, right? But and, or a lot of them actually <laughs> went after the colonies in apartheid South Africa or, or Canada or Australia. These people over the last 30 years particularly have been coming back into... British and American and Canadian and French uh, back home and be influencing their think tanks uh, in their thinking. So if you look at Henry Jackson Society, if you look at Policy Exchange, these people are now thinking, well, actually, we, we are now the sole superpower. Let's try to influence that opinion. And this is a lot of them linked to the neoconservative uh, neo movement that I was telling you about, right? And they've been very effective and they've been very sort of influential and they've given us a, 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 given us a state of government which is extremely authoritarian. With that authoritarianism, they've also been spreading all those sort of what's called the culture wars, primarily used in Muslims. Mm. And that was, remember, in line with the, 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 the establishment's need to dehumanize Muslims to justify killing half a million Muslims, for example. Right? So dehumanization is important. But dehumanization had another effect, which was that radicalize the populations here against Muslims. So based upon that, a lot of people voted Brexit, you know, because they thought they're going to get rid of Muslims. That's how much hatred they had created uh, for Muslims. So these people have achieved that goal, that dehumanization then enables for the state to continue with the live streaming of genocide. So that's what you got, a liberal society actually acting in a fascist way. Mm. So when we have that kind of polity going on, there's no surprise that in Italy, in France, in Germany, here, in America, the, fasc the open, the honest fascist parties are coming to the fore and now winning elections. Mm -hmm. But I will say one positive thing, though. I mean, I don't want to be totally negative, right? Mm -hmm. What it will show, and what I'm seeing is, is that lots of the floaters, the liberal, the respected people, the centrists, who thought, you know what, always like to have, the, be prox have proximity to power, the ones who always want to be measured and they want to be called extremists like you and me, will say, you know what, actually, now we've got to take sides. This is where the opportunities arise. And this is where the communities I was talking to you about, right? This is where we've got to start organizing, work with them, develop them and say, listen, you tried the establishment, you tried to be close to them, and you tried to appease them for so long, it's enough. Really, you've got to choose. Are you with the rest of humanity, or need people with compassion, or are you with the fascists? And I think that's where the opportunities arise. And we saw examples of that when Trump was in power last time, mm. when a lot of the organization, people who were in the Democrat Party, actually went into the grassroots. We started going into mainstream America, and there were some great grassroots movements that were developed. And that's where the danger with the election comes along, and that they get co-opted again into sort of Washington politics or London politics. And because they get co-opted, we lose them. We lose all their resources, all their skills on the, on the grassroots.